Now, when I look back, all of those things led to such great experience that now as a, as a coach, I have the capacity to help so many other businesses because I've been in their shoes in the different types of businesses. I kind of understand. I have that empathy of, of what, what it's like at the top yeah. and at the bottom. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Palmer, and we have a terrific two-part series with collaboration coach and author, Tanya Fox. In part one, she'll discuss her early days of how powerful collaborating can be with others, plus much, much more. All right, let's get to that conversation now. Our guest is a bookkeeper, business coach, and author of How to Collaborate. Tanya Fox, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. I'm really excited to be here today. It's great to have you. And I, uh, I'm, I'm excited about this concept of collaboration and so a little bit of your backstory that I've read so far, so far. So as we get into it, I'd love to hear your backstory so our listener gets to know you a little bit. What, 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 what's your life looked like that's led you up to where you're, what you're doing today? So originally I started, uh, I come from a military family. My mom worked in the government. So that was kind of the path that you took. We had the one uncle who kind of started every uh, fly-by-night, make-you-a-millionaire kind of businesses. So that wasn't mm-hmm. a thing that you did seriously. Okay. And so that was the path that I took. I, I went to university, I got degrees, and then I, I went into working for the government because that's just, that's where you go, Right. And I didn't make it long. I didn't even make it five years. And I was like, I cannot do this, you know, for another 40 years. Like, it's just, it's, it was soul crushing for me personally. And so I thought, you know, on a whim, because of course I was really young at the time, I thought, I'm just going to quit my job and I'm going to start a business because how hard can it be? <laughs> right. And so that's what I did. And I kind of dove in like on fire, uh, really learning the business world by trial and error. Now, this was back in 1998. So like Google was just get like they hadn't even when I first started, they hadn't even got like they hadn't even started yet. Right. And so you were going to like libraries, <laughs> looking through index cards to find info on stuff and, you know, just asking other people. And so it, you know, having that ability to not just be able to Google answers to stuff worked out really, really well for me because I had to meet people <laughs> to be able to right. get to answers to stuff. So I really kind of honed a networking skill unbeknownst to me at that time. And when, you know, to kind of fast forward a little bit after being in business for a couple of years, I found myself in a situation where I was doing really, really well. And on paper, my bookkeeping company was doing really, really well, but I was very cash poor because of course I was trying to grow. So every time more money came in, I was hiring more staff and I was in that growth phase. So Mm -hmm. I was really stuck. I was at the point where I was in an unmarked office and I was like, I need to get a sign or something. Like, how am I, how am I going to do this? And that's when I started figuring out collaboration, which at the time I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew that I needed I needed advertising and I needed to work on something. And so through just kind of failing forward, I, you know, was able to get some advertising. And then I sort of sat back and kind of went, is there a way I can keep doing this? Like, can I duplicate this, you know, where I can kind of get something for nothing kind of thing? And that's what sort of led me to kind of do a little bit more research and do a little bit more deep diving into sort of how I can keep duplicating this result that I was that I was getting. And then so now for 25 years, I just keep doing that. Like, how can I make this bigger? How can I make this more outlandish? How can I 
you know, what other big crazy thing can I sort of try to put together? And so that's what kind of led me to to different careers, to opening different businesses. It was just being in different rooms and somebody being like, you know, have you ever, you know, had a franchise before? You don't understand what it's like until you've owned it. And I was like, okay. So I bought a franchise and Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to own a retail store. So I opened up a retail store. And so once I think I kind of got one business underneath me that was going really good, I started experimenting. And I've never been a person who was like, this is what I want to be when I grow up. I was always like, what do I want to be now? (laughs) And then Mm -hmm. get bored with that and then kind of go, okay, like it's 18, somebody else take it. I don't want it anymore. And was kind of moving on to these different things, not realizing at the time, now when I look back, all of those things led to such great experience that now as a as a coach, I have the capacity to help so many other businesses because I've been in their shoes in the different types of businesses. I kind of understand. I have that empathy of, of what, what it's like at the top yeah. and at the bottom. <laughs> we'll get back to the interview right after this word from our sponsor. Hey, bookkeepers, are you tired? of juggling spreadsheets, chasing down receipts, and spending endless hours on client deliverables, it's time to simplify your workflow with Hub Analytics. Hub Analytics is the financial platform built just for you. We streamline bookkeeping operations so you can focus on what really matters, delivering high quality results for your clients. With our easy to use tools, you'll save time, reduce errors, and gain deeper insights into your clients' financials. Imagine having all your financial data in one place with real-time analytics and customized reports at your fingertips. No more late nights, no more stress, just efficient, accurate bookkeeping that makes you look like the hero you are. Ready to take your bookkeeping to the next level? Visit hub-analytics.com to start your free trial today. Hub Analytics, where smarter bookkeeping begins. Thank you for hearing from our sponsor, Now let's get back to the interview. Interesting story, interesting trajectory. What what was the 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 first collaboration outcome? I'd love to know what that what that looked like. Where you were you were getting something for almost. Yeah, I'd love to hear that story. Nothing, yeah. So originally it was, I needed to do advertising. I'm afraid to say nothing. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's okay. You could say nothing because at the time I was like, I don't feel like this is a fair deal. Um, And that still happens to me today where I'm like, "Mm, I think I'm getting more out of this. And I will say no, that, That isn't true, but I'll explain that after. For sure. I Um, imagine it would be, but it's it's a cool concept. (laughs) Yes. So I needed to do marketing. And at the time, it wasn't like we weren't in a, you know, we weren't in a social media phase at that time. So newspapers, like newspapers and radios, that was, you know, kind of TV was there's no way I was ever affording to do a commercial. Like, you know, even billboards were really expensive at that time. So I, you know, saw an ad in a local newspaper that they were looking for somebody to, you know, do their accounts receivable and accounts payable in their office. And at that time, I was like, you know, I need something to generate more cash so I can pay to advertise my business, so I can get more customers, so I can hire more people. Like it was, I was sort of in this rolling ball trying, trying to kind of pick stuff up. And so originally I thought maybe I just kind of need to go get a job for a little bit and generate some more money so I can have that cash to kind of sort of throw into the business. Because I wasn't willing to downsize. I wasn't willing to let people go. And I wasn't willing to stop the growth. A little naive at the time, but I was like, well, just make more money. That's that's how you do it. And so in sitting in the interview, which the interview was an actual interview. I was applying for the job. And that's when I kind of, you know, they were talking about their struggles that that they were having in business. And, you know, there was other stuff that was coming onto the scene. People weren't advertising as much, you know, so it was only part time because they couldn't really afford full time. And so as they were sort of telling me their story, and I will preface this by saying I am one of those people that can stand in line at a Walmart and all of a sudden I'll have somebody's entire life story. And all I've said, is how are you today? <laughs> right, so, right. so I was kind of getting, I think, more information out of out of these people than what than than maybe what most people on an interview would. Right. And that's when it kind of just it 
it, a sort of a light bulb went off in my head and I thought, you know, what they need, I knew I could do in a very short amount of time. Like, I knew how much time I could stretch it to, to make it a job. But I also knew that the because of my experience, I was like, this is only going to take me like a couple hours a week. This is not going to take me a part-time, you know, length of time to do because I had the experience behind me. And that's when I kind of thought, I wonder if I can like trade. So instead of being stuck here and having and and doing it based on time, so selling my my time for money, I wonder if I can like shorten it and just trade with them. So I'll come in and do your books for you and then you give me the equivalent of what you feel that's worth, so the part-time position in advertising. And we'll they just kind of do that. that. Well, <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, this is dumb, because I knew how much, like, because they were like, oh, so you want, like, a half-page, full-color ad? And I was like, yes. And in my head, I was like, I know how much that costs. But again, I didn't know my own worth at that time, right? So I was like, oh, my God, I'm robbing these people. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it just, I'm yeah. so getting the best end out of the deal. And so we did that for, you know, uh, quite a long period of time where we were sort of doing this trade. And it was working really good. We were making sure that we were checking in with each other, you know, are, is this still valuable to you? Or, you know, are you still feeling like the trade is, you know, you're getting your money's worth out of me and and vice versa. But that was the first time that I was like, uh, wow, this, this worked really well. And it, I didn't know. I wasn't calling it a collaboration at the time. I just said, like, I bartered my way into this big advertising thing. And then their graphic designers were designing stuff for me. And, you know, like, I, it just kind of felt like they were, they were going above and beyond to try to make this worth it. And so going back to what I was saying before, what I realized only years later in doing collaborations is that I had to stop assuming I knew what someone thought I was worth mm -hmm. or what they were getting was worth. Because to me, something that was simple or really easy, I didn't put a high value on it because I was like, I could do that in my sleep. But to them they are going, this would cost me thousands of dollars to do it because I don't have the capacity. I would have to learn. There would be time involved. I just don't have the skill set. I absolutely hate, I mean, that's the thing I hear the most. I absolutely hate doing books. I do not want to do this. Like, it's the bane of my existence. So their idea of the worth of something that is super easy to me was a lot higher uh, yeah. than mine. And so I started to really sit there and go, I have to stop projecting uh, what the value is to somebody else and just allow them to value it themselves and and be grateful for that and be like, wow, that's wonderful that you that you feel that that's its worth. And when I started learning that lesson, the collaborations came a lot easier because then I was like, oh, okay, if you think that's fair, great, let's go with that and stopped going, mm, I don't really, like I'm really getting the big end of the deal. And then I was over delivering and, you know, it caused a lot of a lot of other problems, you know, when, when I was a you know, when I was putting on them what I thought the worth was as and as opposed to just accepting their valuation of it. Yeah. Oh, well, it's a great starting point, too. I mean, if, if you apply that in every scenario, it's like, what do people understanding first? What do they value? Yeah. And what's their perception of the value with you? And that could be, it could go both ways. It could be they overvalue what you're doing. They could undervalue what you're doing. But at least you have a starting point to then work from and hopefully you're on the better side of it but, exactly uh, it's an, it's inter interesting that way <clears throat> and then you you got into a whole bunch of different businesses i'd love to know like were there were there did did the collaborations work with every business it was you, you did retail you did a franchise did the collaborations work in each one of those scenarios they did. Um, sometimes it took a little bit more time, especially in the franchise. That was where I really learned that corporations <laughs> are very hard to work with um, and take a lot longer. Um, so to give you an example, the franchise that we had was a bread company. So we delivered commercial breads like um, Dempster's, McGavin's, Villaggio to retail stores. So grocery stores, Walmart, stuff like that. And I remember sitting, we would have meetings with the drivers and then corporate would sit at their paneled table and they would be like, how's it going? Like, what do you think about this new project? And there was such a 
disconnect, you know, um, between what was actually happening on the ground to, you know, what was happening on a map or in a computer <laughs> in corporate, that I would sit there and go, this is dumb. Like You have the data in these drivers of what works and what doesn't work. You know, they would change routes on us and we'd be like, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense when you drive it. Like, I know when you follow it on a map, but that doesn't make sense because this customer, you know, takes more time or, you know, like it was it, th- sort of those things were happening. And then we would see, like, the company was owned by, uh, like, the the hierarchy of the bread company was owned by Maple Leaf. And for the longest time, I was like, why aren't you guys collaborating together and, like, putting coupons? Like, so if you buy wieners, like hot dog wieners, you get, like, a discount on buns and, and vice versa. So just, like, simple things like that that I was constantly noticing. But I would bring it up and they'd be like, oh, that would take us a really long time. And, and then watching these things take two, three years that I was like, it's just a coupon, guys. Like, oh, my God, it's not that hard. Um, so although it would work in doing, you know, certain things, I realized that doing it at more of a franchisee level and collaborating together worked a lot easier. So we would do things within the franchisee owners that we would um, – One of them, we hired a full-time person. So there was six of us that shared a full-time person. We each only had to pay a sixth of their wage, but we were then all able to take holidays. So this one person was trained and would literally just like jump around from root to root to root. And so that worked really, really well because we all wanted to be able to have somebody who was reliable, who wasn't going to go and look for another job because they weren't getting enough hours. And so that was, you know, I used that one both in the franchise. And I used it when I got into retail as well. Because when I first started the retail, I was kind of owner operator for a little bit at the beginning. And so I was like, I'm just going to duplicate that collaboration I did with other retail stores who are owner operators so we can do stuff. We can go out for lunch. We can, you know, go to meetings. We can join committees, but we can have a dedicated employee who we know we're not going to lose to a full-time position or something that paid more. So there was a lot of times where I I would sit there and say, you know, this collaboration is applicable somewhere else. And then other times where I would like, let's see if we can make this work just for the fun of it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Very interesting uh, approach, you know, going through all of that. And and your bookkeeping business, that was running while you were doing all of this as well. All of them, yeah. yeah. Because every time I started a business, I was, I, of course, I was hiring m- myself, <laughs> essentially, to right. do all of, all of the books. But I had a team at that time. So there, you know, that was going through everybody that I, you know, that I was out meeting. And I also was picking... Uh, different people to sort of collaborate with or to even network with. So I wasn't networking essentially with the owners. I was networking with suppliers. And who is the person who's walking into a a multitude of different businesses? Because I want that person to say my name. I want Mm -hmm. the person who's delivering, you know, goods to restaurants, I want that guy to talk about my name. And if he hears somebody saying, you know, oh, we're looking, you know, for like a new bookkeeper, we're, you know, we're looking for a coach that he would be like, oh, I've got somebody. Like I wanted that person. So it was really interesting when I started kind of going, you know, it's a lot easier to find suppliers to talk about me than owners to talk about me. And so I started changing my perception on who I was networking with and who I was really making sure they knew who I was because they were easier to get my foot in the door. And then I was able to sort of branch them off into whichever business was a fit for them that I was running at that time. Wow. Wow. And, and what, what had you get out of the the, the franchise and the real t- retail? Was it just something you decided to move on from? Yeah, with the franchise business, it was a lot like my my husband was the one who did a lot of the driving and delivering, so I was just kind of like the yeah. loud mouth on the back end at, and at meetings. Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh so it was it was a lot of hours and and we had staff and and stuff like that 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 was working and and doing things for us. But there was the company got bought out. Okay. Um and it, in the buyout, there was a lot of stuff that was happening that we just didn't want to be a part of anymore. Uh, we were stalemated in our growth. We wanted to grow to have multiple routes, and they were trying to stop. 
uh, to stop that. Um, so for us, the, there was no growth there. And we were like, um, we don't want to be stuck here with what we have right now. We want the capacity to grow if we want to. So it just came at, at a time when the when the buyout happened that they said, look, if you want out, uh, we're doing buyout packages. And the buyout package was really good. So we just, we kind of took it and, and, and walked away from it at that time. For the retail store, I actually stopped liking people. Um, <laughs> God bless anybody who's in retail. I've but after there, about yeah. five years... I was losing my filter for some of the questions that that would come in. And it was, I still remember it vividly to the day when when I came home and said to my husband, I'm I'm closing this this the store. And I was waiting for a delivery. All the lights were off. I didn't have any signs on, but my front door was unlocked because the delivery guy, just where we were situated, had to deliver in the front door. And a customer came in. And was walking around and then proceeded to yell at me because it's really hard to shop without the lights on. And I lost it on them. Like, I was like, what are like, are you stupid? Like, I was just like, I'm like, all the lights are off. No sign says open. Like, nothing else downtown is open. What would make you think we were open? Like, and then to to yell at me saying that I was doing like of course yeah. I would turn my lights on. Like, what do you, you know, like, and whereas years before I would be like, oh, we're, you know, we're not open yet. I'm just waiting for a delivery. But I would turn on the lights. I would open the computer. I would allow them to shop. Like, I would do everything I could to sort of accommodate them. So once I realized that I was like, get out, that I was like, maybe I shouldn't be in retail anymore. Yeah. So I, I had a I, moment like that myself where it was just, it got, it was just a breaking po- point and it just, you know, can't see the human anymore. It's like, okay, I got, I'm yeah. turning into a machine. I got to get out of this. Yeah. yeah. And then you realize like you're, you're, you're like, wow, I am saying some things that it's not fair to say. It wasn't fair to yell at that lady. I don't know what kind of day she was having. Usually I would be more empathetic, but I realized, yeah, I just didn't have the patience to, to right. want to do that anymore. So I thought, and I was in a financial situation where I could, where I could mm-hmm. just could. It was a craft store. I loved crafting. So to me, I was like, I don't have, I was in a financial situation where I didn't have to sell the store to break even. I, you know, I, I didn't owe anything on it. I wasn't in debt for anything on it. My lease was up, coming up at that time. Like everything just sort of fell into place that I was like, I could just close it down, take all of my stock and have it in my basement and never have to buy craft supplies again. And that's right. Biggest I customer. would be fine. So <laughs> a windfall you know, sale. <laughs> right. And, and not a situation that everybody can be in. So I do feel very right. fortunate that I didn't, I didn't have to go through selling the business in that aspect of having to right. deal with all of that because that would have been also in a small town you get a lot of tire kickers and so it was very fortunate in that that I was like I think now is the time and so that was in 2018 so I'm glad I did it with everything that then proceeded to happen yeah (laughs) I was like I dodged a bullet there and got out at the right time and and you know that really just came from being in business for so long and owning multiple businesses I learned to really trust my gut instinct. And when I was like, it's time to get out, I would just get out. And Mm -hmm. it it was really hard because when you get into a business, there's a lot of people, especially if you come from a family like mine that isn't full of entrepreneurs that are like, how could you do that? Like, are you unsuccessful? And I'd be like, no. They're like, are you losing money? No. Then why would you sell? That doesn't make any sense at all. But I was like, but people switch jobs all the time and you don't say anything to them. Like, they're like, oh, I just want to change and that's fine. So why isn't this fine? And so I really had to struggle with that for a lot of Mm -hmm. years. But eventually I just realized, no, it's okay. I don't have to know what I want to be when I grow up. I can change it as long as I'm, you know, not losing money or I'm not being irresponsible with my finances when I do this. um, It's okay to just start a business and be like, bye. (laughs) I don't want to do it anymore. That's right. And, uh, you know, most people don't understand business at the best of times, yeah. let alone those kind of intricacies. And so it, it is uh, part of the challenge as a business owner is, you know, a lot of people just can't relate mm-hmm. to, to you. Know? I mean, there's a lot of small business owners out there, but there's, you know, it's very few that actually take those risks and go and actually take the actions and, and start a business. 
So now you've transitioned to, not transition, but somehow this, you wrote a book, you're, you're coaching. Tell us about that journey. So what, I had always wanted to write. Um, I, you know, I'd always journaled when I was younger. I would write ch- short stories, poems, that kind of stuff. But it, I always, so I always thought I was going to write a fiction book. And, um, but I suck with timelines in normal life of like remembering when things happened. So fiction, when I discovered how, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how you have to be very ac- accurate in your timelines, I was like, mm, that might not work not really work. But I really thought that it was going to be a fiction book that that I was going to write. And uh, I was sitting at a conference once with a bunch of ladies and I was talking about, you know, collaborating and, and you know, the work that I do. And I had worked with one of the ladies at the table. And one of the other ones said, you know, I'm a startup and I, I just don't feel like I could afford to have somebody to come in and do this whole thing for me. And one of the things I struggle the most with is everything that's out there. And this was, um, this was 28, 28- 2019, I think. She said, you know, one of the things that I really struggle with is everybody talks about getting from six to seven figures, but nobody talks about like zero to one or zero to four. There's nothing Mm -hmm. out there for those people. And so I feel like there's just like such a void when you, when you first start out. And I remember leaving that, that night. And of course we had a long conversation about it. And I thought, this is it. Like it it just, it, it was like the light bulb went off in my head that I was like, I remember struggling with that. I remember going, I get that this is what you do when you have millions, but how do I get there? Like it, it, we're missing a whole section of the bridge here, people. That's and right. I, I remember finding that frustration. And so when I sat down, I thought, I want to teach people how to do collaborations. And of course, those that can hire me just, just do. But what about the people who are sitting there who who want a book? So when I sat down, I thought, I want to write something that is almost like a step-by-step guide that somebody who can't hire me could have me in paper format. And it's like as if I'm sitting there taking them through this whole thing and they can do it DIY. Because I remember what that was like. I remember mm-hmm. that struggle of going, I just need to have somebody to help me now at the price point I can afford now, and then I'll get that really expensive coach, or then I'll hire, you know, sort of that next person. And so I kind of, I had the idea in my hand. I went to, you know, a few people that I knew that introduced me to some some publishing companies. I really wanted to keep it within Canada, being a Canadian. And I, I met with a bunch of companies, but they wanted me to, they wanted the book to be about my really big collaborations that I had done. And they weren't, getting it. They weren't seeing it. I'm like, I don't want to talk about those ones. I want to talk about the small ones. I want to talk about the ones that I did with no money. I want to talk about, you know, that might seem insignificant, but really helped me in business get to the next level. Like the one doing the, you know, with the newspaper and getting an ad put out is considered a small collaboration, but it was so monumental to me. Those are the ones that I wanted to talk about. So it took me probably about a year to finally find a publisher who was like, no, totally get what you're doing. Absolutely, we're, we're sort of behind you on that. And so I started the journey going to writing retreats and trying to figure it out of, of you know, h- how to write a book, which is like a whole other thing. <laughs> it's, right. I honestly went into it going, I just sit down and just like type what I'm thinking and voila, a book comes out. It is a thousand times not like that. (laughs) But, you know, and so, and so that's where the idea sort of came. And I, you know, spent two years sort of trying to, to write this book, make it understandable, do testing with it to see, does it make sense? It makes sense to me, but I also know what I'm talking about. So, you know, having people that, you know, had no experience with me, had no, you know, prior connection to me to sit and read the, you know, go through the book, do the exercises and see if it worked for them. Um, and that was the best part of writing the book was kind of doing that beta testing with people. That was so much fun. Um, and so that's kind of how it came to be. And I, I think still to this day, having that experience was so crucial to me because what it also did is made me realize that where my passion, what I really love to do was also helping those people who were stuck. So it made me take a step back from my coaching and go, I want to stop with the the large companies. I want to go back to basics. I want to go back to small business owners. I want to go back to that person that I was years ago when I was starting. And at every moment that I started a business, that's the person I want to help. Um, and so 
I really kind of did a whole revamp of of my business going, I want to change what I'm doing. My idea of success is is changing now. Um, And it's not about the money. It's about how many people I can help so they don't have to go through you know, 25 years <laughs> of mm-hmm. the struggle. Um, so it was really interesting how every single moment sort of sort of changed my idea of of business and and what I was doing. And I'm very grateful for it because I'm it's very fulfilling. Not that other stuff, not that the the money is fulfilling, let's be honest. But it's a different kind of fulfillment now. And I'm really, really enjoying it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it, it's uh I can totally get that. It's uh, if we only did it for the money, that gets old, and yeah. and so it's the being able to help as many people as you can and expand on that, and and th- the more value uh, that that people drive in the world, the it comes back right yeah. different in different ways. Absolutely, that was a great chat with Tanya. Now, in part two of our conversation, she'll discuss how you can create terrific collaborations between your own clients. Plus, she'll share the most important thing a bookkeeper can do for their client. And with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast to learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources you can go to, thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.